It was a race that had few rules. Its competitors, fewer scruples. Some men would lie, cheat, and steal to win. Others would sacrifice their own lives and those of their companions. Two men, Norwegian Ruald Amundsen and Englishman Robert Scott, prepared for a similar quest. Their target, the last great geographical prize, the South Pole. To reach it, they faced a harrowing journey. Only one of them would make it back alive. Naval service had long been tradition in the Scott family. When Robert Falcon Scott was born on June 6, 1868, his career as a seaman was preordained. By age 30, he had risen to the rank of torpedo lieutenant, but Scott had no money or family connections to ensure further advancement. Scott felt himself to be intrinsically quite unlucky, that he had to overcome some obstacles which were always being put on it in his path. And it was this sense of struggle, I think, which sort of preyed on his mind at times. Scott's moodiness may have also damaged his chances for promotion. One expert believes his naval records have been censored, concealing negative evaluations of Scott's on-the-job performance. I'm morally certain that the Navy regarded him as a dud. And there is evidence that Scott was regarded as mentally unstable by the Navy, and therefore, under normal conditions, would never have been allowed anywhere near the command of a ship of the line. Scott's future seemed bleak until, in June of 1899, he heard that the Royal Geographical Society was organizing an Antarctic expedition. He knew its president, Sir Clements Markham, was hoping to put a British naval officer at the helm, and Scott personally applied for the job. He thought this was an opportunity which had been cast in his way. He really believed tremendously in fate. He had never, prior to this, thought of being an explorer or trying to get to the South Pole. In his own words, he said, I had no predilection for polar exploration. Gossips noted that Clements Markham seemed to prefer the company of handsome young men to women. Scott's brooding good looks and deep blue eyes, not to mention his charm, certainly caught Markham's attention. On August 6th, 1901, Robert Falcon Scott sailed from the Isle of Wight in command of the National Antarctic Expedition. The expedition ship Discovery had been built especially for polar travel. Most of the crew on board were Navy men like Scott, with no mountaineering or other suitable training for the ordeal that lay ahead. Their selection reflected the bruised state of the British Empire. Queen Victoria died in 1901 after a very long successful reign. And the British were finding themselves embroiled in a very difficult war in South Africa against the Boers. And there was this sense that somehow the British were losing their place in the world, that there was a softness creeping in. To Clements Markham, Scott and his men represented the epitome of British manhood. Navy men who would battle the Antarctic and prove that the empire could still win the day. January 3rd, 1902. Five months after leaving England, Lieutenant Robert Scott and his ship Discovery crossed the Antarctic Circle. Perhaps it was here, dwarfed by these massive icebergs, that Scott began to envision a greater glory for England and for himself, to be the first to plant a flag at the South Pole. The Southern Pole had long played a secondary role to the North. Sealers and whalers visited Antarctica's outer islands to conduct their bloody hunts, while ice and fierce storms protected its inner shores. Man had yet visited only a few coastal areas of the mainland when Scott's discovery docked on the edge of the Great Ice Barrier. 
a vast shelf of ice the size of Texas that permanently covers part of the Ross Sea. The sun shines with extraordinary hard white glitter. There is nothing soft in the landscape at all. It dazzles you, it takes you out of yourself. It produces the wish to measure yourself against all that emptiness, all that delectable snow. It seduces you and it is completely indifferent. The men explored glaciers where ice crackled like gunfire and snow concealed gaping crevices. Their wonder turned to horror when one crewman slipped on a steep slope and fell to his death into the ocean below. In late April, the sun sank below the horizon for its winter hibernation. For three months, the men huddled in their quarters as storms raged outside. When night gave way to the midnight sun, Scott prepared to set out on an exploratory sledge journey inland. He selected two men to accompany him. The first was Edward Wilson, an amiable doctor and artist, whom the men had dubbed Uncle Bill. The second was Ernest Shackleton, an engaging Anglo-Irishman with polar ambitions of his own. On November 2nd, 1902, the three men saluted king and country with a champagne toast before the sledges pulled away. Scott's goal was to reach a record farthest south, possibly the South Pole itself. At first, the sledges virtually flew forward, but it wasn't long before the dogs became ill. The men used whips to spur them on. Still, their pace slackened. They found the dogs very difficult to handle. Scott, in particular, had a true, I suppose you describe it as Englishman sentimentality about animals. The thought of having to use cruelty to make them work was something which was deeply stressful to him. Scott lightened their loads, but this meant that the three men had to continually backtrack over their previous route in order to carry all their supplies forward. Their rations of seal meat, biscuits, and pemmican were inadequate for such taxing labor. December 30th, 1902. Scott and his men reached within 400 miles of the pole, a new farthest south, before turning for home. A few days later, the last dog died. The exhausted men attached themselves to the harnesses and began to manhaul their supplies. Shackleton's condition was by far the worst, leaving him unable to help pull the sledge. This incident would sever the bond between Scott and his Irish colleague and reveal a ruthless side of the explorer's ambition. Scott saw this as a kind of moral collapse. He was very resentful that they, they had to carry the weight of Shackleton on the sledge and he never really forgave him for it. In return, Shackleton never forgave Scott for the cold glances that he poured on him during that time. The exhausted team arrived safely back at Discovery. Scott spent another year exploring, then filled with sadness, finally sailed from the Antarctic shores. He truly fell in love with it. It captured something in his soul it appealed to that dreaming, creative side of him that somehow couldn't be satisfied by his career in the Navy. Robert Falcon Scott's first trek out on the ice would define the man's future. He would shape his approach to all Antarctic travel from this first failure with sled dogs. A decision that would one day put his life and the lives of his men at the mercy of the elements. That same year, the man who would one day be Scott's competitor, Ruald Amundsen, was following his own compass toward the pole. I think the most important things for Amundsen wasn't to discover the world, but that the world should discover him. <laughs> 
the tiny country of Norway was nearing a crossroad when Ruald Amundsen was born on July 16, 1872. After 400 years of foreign rule, the last 60 under Swedish dominion, this nation of two million people was struggling for its independence. Norway needed heroes at this point, very much. We didn't have very much uh, self-confidence. And of course, we had one specialty, and that was coldness, snow, ice. Like Peary and Cook, Ruald had grown up admiring the early Arctic explorers and hoped to follow in their footsteps one day. Now, Amundsen prepared himself very, very thoroughly. He had started as a youth to make himself a good skier and make himself awfully fit. He was, in many ways, a, a fitness freak. Amundsen's first test came as second mate aboard Belgica when that ship was locked in the ice off the coast of Antarctica in 1898. There, the 26-year-old Amundsen had befriended Dr. Frederick Cook. Scurvy plagued the health of the crew during that long, sunless winter. After one man died, his body consigned to the water below the ship, his mates swore they could hear his ghostly cries. Dr. Cook calls it a madhouse. Amundsen's reaction was very, very interesting. In the midst of these horrors, he stood back and was able to look at his shipmates and himself with clinical distance and analyze what was going on. Amundsen was one of the first to follow Dr. Cook's advice and eat an unappetizing but healing portion of raw seal meat. To the stoic Norwegian, each obstacle was a test of his fortitude and adaptability. The sun begins its return, but I have not missed it for one moment. On the contrary, I regret nothing and hope I have the health and strength to continue the work I have now begun. Amundsen returned home, eager to build on his experiences and command an expedition of his own. His adventurous spirit next carried him into northern waters, where he endeavored to become the first man to navigate the Northwest Passage through Arctic Canada. He chartered a small sloop, the Ewa, and supplied her for Arctic travel. But Amundsen had a superstitious nature and chose to play down the objective of the expedition. He stole away at the witching hour because he didn't want a send-off. He was in financial difficulties and afraid of his creditors. But it was not only that. He was afraid that having a great send-off would tempt fate and therefore put a curse on the expedition. Amundsen's first expedition proved a brilliant success. Over the course of two years, he successfully navigated the Northwest Passage. Meanwhile, Amundsen continued his education in polar survival by studying the local Inuit. He also perfected a technique of cross-country skiing alongside sledges. The pace of the skier and the dogs seemed naturally synchronized, which increased his traveling speeds. When the Ewa re-emerged north of Alaska, Norway had gained her independence and welcomed him home as a favored son. He didn't care for the plaudits. He wanted the approval of his peers, but he didn't care, he didn't, he didn't care about the crowd. You see, he was an artist. And what he felt was, the Northwest Passage, it is my painting, what the night watchman would have been to Rembrandt. Now, as the explorer retreated to his home on the waters of the Buna Fjord, he set his sights on his next target. Once again, he wasn't looking south. It was 1905, and like Peary and Cook, Amundsen had his eye on the still undiscovered North Pole. Robert Falcon Scott rode a wave of celebrity upon his return from Antarctica, and his success won him a promotion to captain. In 
After a few years of quiet naval service, Scott began to plan his return to Antarctica, only to learn that his estranged colleague, Ernest Shackleton, whose weakness he had openly disdained, was launching an expedition of his own. I am astonished. Shackleton owes everything to me. First and last, I did much for him. His first reaction was one of extreme anger. And I think what really got to him was the fact that Shackleton intended to return to the same area and wished to use the same facilities to stake a claim on what he clearly perceived to be his territory. Like Peary before him, Scott felt a jealous proprietorship over the polar landscape he had once commanded. Scott behaved as if he'd been betrayed, as if his property had been stolen, as if his, his moral rights had been impinged on. Shackleton sailed for Antarctica in July of 1907 and against Scott's protests, established his base at McMurdo Sound. Relying on Siberian ponies instead of dogs, Shackleton explored a route up the Beardmore Glacier that cut through the mountains. He continued until he was within 97 miles of the South Pole. There, Shackleton made a difficult decision. He turned for home because he'd calculated that the food just wouldn't stretch that far. He hated it, but he'd done the sums, he knew the truth, so he turned back. When Shackleton's wife asked him how he had the courage to turn back so close to the goal, he said, ah, oh, he said, I thought you'd rather have a live donkey than a dead lion. While Shackleton was setting records in Antarctica, Robert Scott was having difficulty funding another expedition to the South Pole. Then on September 2nd, 1909, newspapers around the world reported Dr. Frederick Cook's attainment of the North Pole. Within days, Robert Peary's counterclaim made headlines. This American victory reignited the flames of British nationalism. That same week, Scott finally announced the formation of his next Antarctic expedition. His goal was to reach the South Pole and secure for the British Empire the honor of this achievement. In the months that followed, Scott charted the small but sturdy Terra Nova. Once again, he staffed the expedition team with amateurs. Remembering the painful experiences of his first Antarctic trek, Scott decided to limit his reliance on sledge dogs. Instead, he ordered three highly experimental motorized sledges, and following Shackleton's lead, a stable of Siberian ponies. When Commander Robert Peary heard of Scott's unorthodox strategy, he warned the British commander against it. I was with Scott for two weeks before his expedition started, and I talked dogs and dogs with him, but without results. Scott stubbornly clung to his plans. After all, ponies had helped his rival Shackleton reach within 100 miles of the pole. Thousands of well-wishers cheered the Terra Nova as she departed Cardiff in mid-June of 1909. We may get through. We may be wiped out. It is all a question that lies with providence and luck. Scott realized that if he failed to reach the pole, Shackleton was waiting for another opportunity to steal the prize. What the commander of the Terra Nova didn't know was that a new competitor, Ruald Amundsen, had secretly entered the contest. He was destined to make his name in Antarctica, but Ruald Amundsen had originally set his sights on the Northern Pole. In the years following his navigation of the Northwest Passage, he had begun to work towards attaining this prize. He obtained Fridjof Nansen's permission to use the famous ice ship Fram, which had carried Nansen to glory during his attempt to the North Pole in 1895. Amundsen hoped she would do the same for him. He was already supplying the ship 
when the news of Cook and Peary's claims to the North Pole reached Norway. That must have been a shock, a great shock to Amundsen. And he thought, what shall I do? But in one night or two, he saw clearly that he only had one choice left. Nothing else remained for me than to try to solve that last great question, the South Pole. Amundsen quietly reorganized his supplies and equipment for an assault on his new southern target. Except for a few close associates, he told no one of his intentions, not even his crew. Amundsen knew that Nansen had dreams of capturing the South Pole himself and would never support his change of plans. Then, only days later, Robert Scott publicly announced the formation of the British expedition. Amundsen realized then the fat was in the fire because his own government would stop him because nobody wanted to antagonize Britain, which then was one of the great powers and one of the protectors, one of Norway's protectors. As was his custom, Amundsen set sail from the Norwegian capital at midnight. He waited until the Fram reached Madeira off the west coast of Africa before informing his crew of their true destination. There was a very, very dramatic scene when he told them that he'd bamboozled them. And by his sheer force of character, a bit like Ulysses, I, one could imagine, he made them agree to go with him, most of them against their will. From Madeira, Amundsen sent a letter to Nansen explaining his plans in full. As a courtesy, a telegram was also sent to Robert Scott. Ruald Amundsen had pulled off his bold deception, but not without a price. He had fooled the world, the nation, the king, pretty of Nansen. He couldn't come back without having been the first man on the pole. That was a question about life or death for Amundsen. Meanwhile, in Melbourne, Australia, Robert Scott had stopped ashore to spend an evening alone with his wife. There, the captain found Amundsen's telegram waiting for him. Beg leave to inform you from proceeding Antarctic. Amundsen. He was shocked. He certainly hadn't expected it. What this was actually now about was a, a race. And there was all the expectation back in Britain that if there was going to be a race, well, Scott must be the one to win it. Now, as Scott's overloaded Terra Nova slowly continued southward, it seemed that his brief run of good fortune was running out. If Amundsen wants to try for the South Pole, I can only wish him luck. In the weeks that followed, Terra Nova suffered through fierce gales that threatened to sink the ship. The men were grateful to be back on solid ground when the ship dropped anchor near the old base at McMurdo Sound. But their luck hadn't improved. As the men unloaded one of the motorized sledges, it fell, crashing through the ice into the ocean below. A month later, during an exploratory excursion, Terra Nova crew members were surprised to sight the Fram in the Bay of Wales. From that position, Amundsen was 60 miles closer to the pole. Scott was furious when he heard the news, but vowed to go on without fear or panic. Both expeditions used the summer months to stockpile supplies along their polar routes. However, Amundsen stashed 10 times more per person than Scott, greatly increasing any margin for error. With the onset of winter, Scott and Amundsen could only wait for the sun to return so that the race could finally begin. On his part, the Englishman knew that his Norwegian rival's experience with dogs 
might lend Amundsen an advantage. As for ruled Amundsen himself, he began to worry that Scott's motorized sledges might provide a real threat to his own well-laid plans. Amundsen was plagued all that winter by the fear of Scott. He could almost hear those motor sledges puffing away. And so he decided that he was going to set off for the pole ridiculously early in the season. Temperatures hovered near minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit as the party of eight men and 86 dogs set out for the pole on September 8th, 1911. The going was glorious. Rarely have I known the going so good. In the days that followed, the thermometer dropped to minus 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Even the sledge dogs were suffering. Amundsen faced a difficult decision. Would he go forward in these hellish conditions or turn back, risking the prize? If we are to win this game, the pieces must be moved carefully. One false move and everything can be lost. After six days, they made a mad dash back to the safety of their base, where one of the men, Hjalmar Johansson, assailed his commander's poor decision-making. I don't call it an expedition. It's a panic. Amundsen responded by removing him from the polar party. 150 miles to the east, Robert Scott and his men prepared for their own dash for the pole. October 24th, 1910. Advanced teams of the English Polar Expedition headed out to stockpile additional supplies. Robert Scott's main party followed on the 1st of November. The transportation logistics of Scott's plan soon began to fall apart. The motorized sledges broke down very quickly. Unfortunately, they hadn't yet got engines which were reliable at low temperatures. There was a dog team zipping around, moving embarrassingly fast and really demonstrating that they should all be traveling with dog teams. In contrast, Scott's Siberian ponies proved ill-suited to the climate as they struggled in the heavy snow. It was a very bad plan to bring them in the first place. Their coats were much too thin for the temperatures. They quickly became emaciated and they died. And Scott felt as if he was drowning kittens daily. December 9, we have camped and the ponies have been shot. Poor beasts. They have done wonderfully well considering the terrible circumstances. Even after the loss of the motorized sledges and the ponies, Scott sent the dog teams back to the base camp as he had originally planned. He was never convinced that dogs could be uh, pushed up a glacier or could be used to take him across the polar plateau to the pole. Scott and his men who went forward were reliant purely on their own efforts, man-hauling sledges that weighed 700 pounds apiece. The men began to climb through the ice falls of the Beardmore Glacier, following the route that Ernest Shackleton had pioneered in 1908. At the end of each day, Scott measured their distances against his former colleague's pace. In a way, Shackleton was a more real opponent for him than Amundsen, who was there at the same time, who was actually racing him. It was the ghost of Shackleton who, who, who led Scott on. The Beardmore Glacier opened upon the vast windswept polar plateau. Reaching 10,000 feet above sea level, it is the coldest place on Earth. Temperatures can drop to minus 126 degrees Fahrenheit. With only 150 miles to the pole, Scott selected the men who would fill out his final four-man team. There was Edward Wilson, the gentle naturalist and doctor and very gifted artist who'd been with him on the Discovery Expedition. He also chose Edgar Evans, this very tall, robust Welshman. Captain Oates, in a sense, you could say, was an outsider. He didn't come from a naval background. He came from the army. To everyone's surprise, Scott named a fifth man, 
Bertie Bowers to the team. That's five people in a four-man tent, um, five people with four men's rations. As the five men of the Polar Party began their final push, temperatures ranged from a balmy daytime measurement of 26 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 10 degrees at night. The explorers were wet through almost all the time. They were wearing canvas outfits, unlike the furs that Amundsen was using, and it didn't wick sweat away from their skins at all. So their outfits froze solid during the nights, and when they put them on in the morning, um, they would melt on their skin, so they were constantly damp. This afternoon, we got about 10 minutes of snow, which was like breaking through a glass house at each step. Most of us are using goggles with glass of light green tint. We find this color very grateful to the eyes. With each man harnessed to the sledge, they averaged from five to 13 miles a day. They were expending more calories than they were taking in. Slowly, hour by hour, their strength began to ebb. By the time Scott passed Ernest Shackleton's farthest south, the men were showing signs of scurvy. In similar circumstances, the wary Shackleton had turned back. Scott went on because he was always inclined to believe that you could nudge the calculations by putting a bit more effort in. He thought that spiritual resources would get you through if there weren't enough biscuits. It was a terrible seduction. Step by step, pulling their heavy load, the five men marched on over the hypnotic landscape. As they neared the South Pole, their weary spirits lifted. It was Bertie Bowers who spotted what looked like a small black speck on the horizon, and he thought, first of all, that it was some sort of natural formation. But, of course, as they got closer, the horrible truth became inescapable. What they'd actually been looking at was a flag, which had been left as a marker by Amundsen and his Norwegian party. The date was January 16th, 1911. Scott and his men had traveled over 800 miles in 78 days, only to discover that Amundsen had already captured their prize. For Scott, it was pain almost beyond reason. We have had a horrible day. Great God, this is an awful place and terrible enough for us to have labored to it without the reward of priority. Scott and his men could only guess at the events which had brought the Norwegians to victory. October 20th, 1911. The Great Ice Barrier, Antarctica. Determined to beat Robert Scott to the pole, Roald Amundsen struck out for the second time. Amundsen didn't know that he was leaving 11 days before the Englishman, giving him an advantage from the start. Even with dogs pulling the sledges, going was slow due to high winds and heavy snows. Unlike Scott, walking in the boot prints of his former colleague, Ernest Shackleton, Amundsen was forging a new route through unexplored terrain. Everything was a mystery. So that meant for the last nearly 500 miles, he was a combination of an Olympic ski racer and an explorer in completely unknown territory. After threading his way through the ice falls of the Axel Heiberg Glacier, Amundsen reached the Antarctic Plateau. Here, at the place he dubbed the butcher shop, the weakest dogs were killed and fed to the hungry survivors. From there, Amundsen's trek proceeded with an almost arrogant efficiency. With his combined use of cross-country skis and sledge dogs, his teams averaged 15 miles a day. A brilliant sun blazed overhead when the navigators signaled them to stop. 360 degrees of unbroken whiteness declared the truth. They were the first men to reach the South Pole. The date was December 15th, 1911. Scott and his men wouldn't arrive here for another 35 days. 
Amundsen asked each of his four teammates to place a hand on the staff as he drove the Norwegian flag into the ice. It was the only way I could show my companions my gratitude here at this desolate and forlorn place. Amundsen's men were in such good spirits that they gleefully raced each other as they headed back across the Arctic Plateau. By January 30th, they were on board the Fram, steaming through the ice toward civilization and glory. Word of Amundsen's victory hit newsstands all over the world. In Norway, he was exalted in the press, although some were uneasy with this triumph at the expense of their British friends. It was felt that he had been dishonest. This hurt him, I think, at one level, but at another level, uh, he didn't care. The main thing, he had attained what he'd set out to in the manner in which he had proposed. When Amundsen began his first lecture tour in Australia and New Zealand, no one had yet heard from Robert Scott or the Terra Nova. January 16, 1911. After a difficult journey to reach the South Pole, Captain Robert Scott and his four companions planted the British flag 35 days after Ruald Amundsen had claimed the prize for Norway. The Englishmen had no energy to hide their disappointment. If you look at the photograph which they took of themselves at the pole, these five weary men who'd struggled so far and been through so much, you can see the defeat in their faces, their expression. There's no light, there's no joy. Their spirits broken. They now faced a return trek of over 800 miles. Their bodies, overtaxed and malnourished, were already breaking down. Scott's journal entry for that day spells out the blunt reality. Now for the run home and a desperate struggle. I wonder if we can do it. The quantity of effort that went into the, the return journey is, is almost beyond human description. They hadn't been indoors for months. They hadn't been comfortable for months. But they managed to gut it out. Their pace getting gradually slower and slower and slower. A terrible thing to do to a set of bodies. The robust Welshman, Edgar Evans, succumbed first. He just really dropped out of the party and they found him wandering, later lying in the snow. It was a terrible psychological blow. Negger Evans had died and they had to turn their backs on him and go on without him. The four remaining men inched down the Beardmore Glacier and reached the Great Ice Barrier. They still had hundreds of miles to travel, but food and fuel were running low. Frostbite was ravaging their hands and feet, making it difficult to walk. The right foot of Army Captain Titus Oates was so completely frozen that he cut a hole in a sleeping bag, preferring to leave it exposed to the elements rather than endure the pain of thawing. By Saturday, March 17th, he had lost all hope of surviving. Scott recorded his final moments. He was a brave soul. It was blowing a blizzard. He said, I'm just going outside and maybe some time. I've not seen him since. Robert Scott, Edward Wilson, and Bertie Bowers managed to press ahead a few more miles before a blizzard trapped them in their tent. With no fuel and no food, they began writing farewell letters to loved ones back home. It was Scott who wrote the most and the longest. He wrote funeral music in words for the expedition. He made it seem as if a huge, invisible, somber orchestra were, were playing them off the stage of history. I think the last chance is gone. We've decided not to kill ourselves, but to fight to the last for that depot. For his sake, I do not regret this journey, which has shown that Englishmen can endure hardship. After all, we've given our lives for our country. We've actually made the longest journey in the He wrote and wrote and wrote endlessly. Every time he breathed on 
on the pages of his notebook, a thin sheet of ice would develop there, which he'd have to scrape off again so that the pencil would work. On March 29th, Captain Robert Falcon Scott managed one last entry in his journal. Outside the swirl of the tent remains a scene of whirling drift. I do not think we can hope for better things now. We shall stick it out to the end, but we are getting weaker, of course, and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. Ah, Scott, for God's sake, look after our people. Nine months passed before a search party from Terra Nova located a small mound covered with snow. It was Scott's tent. Inside lay the frozen bodies of their comrades. They had died less than 11 miles away from One Ton Depot, a life-saving cache of food. For me, really one of the most compelling parts of the whole story is not that Scott and his men failed, but that they so very nearly succeeded. The grief-stricken survivors collected the letters and journals, then collapsed the tent over the dead men's bodies. They erected a stone monument to mark the grave. Flags around the world were lowered to half-mast as news of the catastrophe spread. In England, thousands of mourners filled St. Paul's Cathedral for a memorial service. Money poured in for the family members of the deceased. With war looming in Europe, the images of Scott and his dead companions were held up as heroic examples of the consummate British male. Scott's final words had accomplished the writer's mission. Those are words with an incredible power to spread. Virtually everybody on the planet who read the newspapers in 1913 knew what Oates's final words had been when he stepped out into the snow. They were global celebrities. Ruald Amundsen was lecturing in America when he received word of Scott's death. It was a terrible shock to him. It was totally unexpected. He was never in Scott's shadow as long as Scott appeared to be alive. But when Scott died, it drove him to the edge of sanity. Amundsen remained active in polar exploration. In 1926, he joined an Italian, Umberto Nobile, for another historic polar expedition. He f flew in an airship across the Arctic Ocean and past the North Pole, therefore becoming the first man indisputably to have past the North Pole, and certainly the first man ever to have reached both poles of the Earth. In May of 1928, when the Italian's airship crashed during another Arctic flight, Amundsen rushed to join the massive search effort. On June 18, 1928, he took off in a small plane and headed north out over the ice. The 55-year-old polar legend was never seen again. It was a suitable end. In a way, it was like the old Viking chiefs who, when their time was come, uh, would, uh, would just go out on one of their ships. Amundsen, in my view, was the greatest polar explorer, bar none. He was an artist. He was an artist in action. The untimely passing of Robert Scott and his men marked the end of an era. The North and South Poles were no longer mysteries. For the most part, the surface of the Earth was mapped. I think that with Scott's death, something else died, which was the idea that nature was there to be conquered. We don't see it as a huge thing which might crush us, which we must nobly fight against. I think we see it linked to the rest of the planet much more now. Today, 
men and women still struggle each year to reach the ends of the Earth. Only now there are satellites tracking their positions. In Antarctica, an isolated scientific station marks the spot where Amundsen first staked the Norwegian flag. The North Pole and the South, two geographic prizes to which men assign the inestimable value of honor, of reputation, of human life. Were the prizes worth the price? The search for the North Pole especially was an exercise in futility. What does it prove? What do you, what do you learn from finding the North Pole except that you had a hell of a long walk, you know? There's nothing there. Perhaps we have lost our ability to appreciate achievement without decrying the motive behind the deed. No man moves without ambition. No great man excels without a dream. The struggle to reach the poles was the culmination of centuries of exploration. Peary, Cook, Amundsen, and Scott had gone where other men could only dream. The prospect of adventure and a desire for glory had driven them out into the cold. These two empty stretches of ice merely provided the stage for their immortal race into history.